Hi everybody! This unit introduces you to some of the more common plants found in the Coast Redwood Forest plant community. More specifically, it describes some of the adaptations to shade exhibited by these plants. And you'll have the opportunity to observe these adaptations firsthand when we either visit Nicene Marks or Henry Cowell State Park. While the plant examples shown in this presentation are components of the redwood plant community, the adaptations to shade that I'm going to talk about can be observed in shade plants from any woodland or forest plant community from anywhere in the world, not just California and not just the coast red redwood forest ecosystem. The dense canopy of the redwood trees intercepts most of the incoming solar radiation and the resulting shade in the understory limits the light dependent process of photosynthesis for plants in this habitat. Less photosynthesis means plants have less energy for growth and reproduction. Redwood trees also shed copious amounts of needles, creating acidic leaf litter that can be several inches thick. The combination of shade, leaf litter plus root competition from the trees creates a challenging environment for the understory plants. In spite of this, there's a layered structural complexity to the understory that includes plants of varying types and sizes that exhibit a really interesting range of adaptations for surviving and reproducing in this shady environment. Coast redwood forest is obviously dominated by coast redwoods, both in quantity and sheer size, but there are also other smaller trees that are commonly found in this plant community. You'll often see California bay, tan oak, dug fir, and madrone. In moist areas where there are openings in the redwood canopy, you'll often find the winter deciduous trees, big leaf maple and red alder or white alder. These deciduous trees are also common components of the riparian woodland plant community. Compared to other plant communities where light isn't such a limiting factor to growth, Coast Redwood Forest doesn't have a dense shrub layer. Growing large and producing lignin are energy intensive processes which require light. So rather than putting scarce energy resources into growing big, shrubs tend to stay relatively small and a few in number. Some shrubs also conserve energy by being winter deciduous and losing their leaves during the months when the hours of daylight are particularly low. Examples of winter deciduous shrubs include beaked hazelnut, thimbleberry and western azalea. The leaves of plants growing in the shade have several adaptations for optimizing photosynthesis in low light levels. In order to capture as much light as possible, the leaves of shade plants tend to be larger than leaves that are exposed to more sunlight. Shade leaves are rarely pubescent. This means hairy. A glabrous or smooth leaf that has a chlorophyll content equal to that of a pubescent leaf can absorb up to 54% more light than a pubescent leaf. This is because the hairs reflect some of the incoming solar radiation so it never reaches the chloroplasts, which are the organelles in the leaf cells which capture light. Shade leaves also tend to be thinner than those of plants growing in more sunlight because they don't need a thick waxy epidermis that reflects solar radiation or limits water loss. The photo on the right here shows a common herbaceous perennial seen in the redwood forest. This is wild ginger, Azarum cordatum. It's called wild ginger because it le its leaves and stems smell like ginger when they're bruised. It has large glabrous leaves that are oriented horizontally in order to expose as much surface area as possible to incoming solar radiation. We have three species of wild ginger in California, all of which are low growing herbaceous perennials found in forest ecosystems and you can go to Calscape, Calflora, and the Jepson E. flora to learn more about each of these three species. The species found in Santa Cruz County is Azarum cordatum, 
whose specific epithet refers to the chordate or heart-shaped leaves. Wild ginger spreads by thick rhizomes and often forms a really thick carpet of foliage on the floor, often in conjunction with redwood sorrel. It has particularly fascinating flowers, or at least I think so, which are usually hidden below the foliage. In cultivation, a good way to appreciate the flowers more easily is to plant wild ginger in a tall raised container where the stems can drape over the edge and you don't have to bend over so far to see the flowers. The flowers are a dark maroon or brownish burgundy in colour and consist of three fused sepals that have long, long slender tapering tails at their tips. Ants act as dispersal agents for the seed and some sources claim that the flowers are pollinated by fungus gnats. But research back in 1982 at Humboldt State University by Karen Liu didn't confirm this and showed that there's actually a high level of self-pollination in Azarum cordatum. But let's get back to adaptations to shade by plants in the coast redwood forest. The production of flowers and petals that have colourful pigments is energy intensive, so the flowers of shrubs in the forest tend to be fairly small and are often white, cream or pale green. Examples shown in the photos here are huckleberry, California coffeeberry, thimbleberry and salal. Because the production of lignin, which is one of the main support and strengthening components of plant cell walls, is energy intensive, low growing herbaceous plants dominate the understory in the coast redwood forest. Their flowers are often small, just like the shrubs that I just mentioned, and not brightly coloured. Four of the most common examples you're likely to see locally include all four of the plants pictured here on the right, which are redwood sorrel, hedge nettle, wild strawberry or wood strawberry, and yerba buena. Yerba buena has highly aromatic foliage that smells minty and its leaves can be used to make a tea. Wood strawberry produces fruit that are small but they're really sweet and very tasty, unlike its relative beech strawberry that grows in the sand dunes close to the ocean and whose fruit are quite mealy and bitter. Redwood sorrel is one of the most common herbaceous plants in the coast redwood forest, often forming extensive low-growing carpets of foliage with wild ginger. The plant pictured here in the larger photo is a selection of Oxalis oregana called Klamath ruby, which was selected for the particularly colourful purple pigmentation on the underside of its leaves. What you can also see in this photo is redwood sorrel's interesting adaptation to drought stress. Normally the three leaflets of each leaf of Oxalis oregana are held horizontally as you can see in the photo inset here. And they're held horizontally in order to optimize the capture of sunlight. In response to drought stress though, the leaflets fold inwards, as you can see in the larger photo, and this protects the stomata and reduces the exposed surface area, and this reduces water loss from the foliage. Some of the herbaceous plants conserve energy by having a short growing season. They burst into growth with winter rains, then often die back to an underground rhizome or rootstock during the summer months. An example of a plant that does this is Western Bleeding Heart, Dicentra formosa, pictured on the right here. Here are three other plants which also go dormant during the summer. Fernald's iris, Iris fernaldii, giant trillium, and the fern, California polypody. It's important to note that in a cultivated landscape, providing summer irrigation doesn't necessarily keep all of these plants from going dormant. Some of them have what's called obligate dormancy, 
which means that no matter how much irrigation or additional light we give them during the summer, they'll still go dormant. And the fern California polypody is a really good example of this. In fact, if you give it too much water during the summer, invariably the plant's going to die because the rhizomes are going to rot. Some herbaceous plants have leaves with a disticus leaf arrangement. This means that their leaves are arranged in a single plane along just two sides of the stem, as you can see in the picture on the right here with the false feathery Solomon seal. This plant has long stems that arch out horizontally instead of vertically. And the disticus arrangement of the leaves combined with the arching growth habit exposes the largest possible leaf surface area to sunlight. Let's finish this unit by summarizing the information that's been covered. The coast redwood forest plant community is dominated by coast redwoods, but there are other trees too that are commonly associated with this ecosystem. Locally, this includes madrone, dug fir, California bay laurel, tan oak, big leaf maple, and alder. The redwood forest is a challenging environment for plant growth. Light levels are low, there's root competition from the tree roots, and copious amounts of leaf litter. In spite of the adverse environmental conditions, though, there's a wide range of plants in the understory. This includes shrubs, but herbaceous plants are more dominant. Plants in the understory exhibit a range of strategies for coping with the shade created by the dense leaf canopy of the redwoods. These adaptations to shade include optimizing the capture of light by having a larger leaf size, by having thinner leaves, or orienting the leaf surface towards the light. Energy is conserved by producing smaller flowers and flowers with very little pigmentation. By being winter deciduous and by having a short growing season or dying back to an underground storage organ. Now head back to Canvas to finish up this unit on the Coast Redwood Forest ecosystem.